kind of a starting point. Now, Patient Portal is integrated into Aprima. It is our product. It's simply an extension of what we do. It is fully integrated in the respect that you can have two-way communication with your patients. Patients can do input that is readily imported into the record. It's actual data, structured data. And you can push things out to the portal like clinical summaries, test results, and, and things of that nature. Okay? So a tremendous engagement tool. Now, my first patient up here on my calendar, so I'm kind of touching up her left-hand corner of the screen overall, Karen Berlin, is also who we're going to look at here on the patient portal. Okay? You control all functions that are made available to your patients. You control all of the content that goes to the portal. Okay? So I have most of the portal capability turned on. Therefore, there's probably going to be things in here that uh, really aren't relevant to, to podiatry, but we'll, we'll point those things out. Right, this would be tied into your website. So patients would be able to readily access your website, pretty common way of doing it. It's also available uh, more of a kiosk function within the office. So I come in, there's things you want me to complete prior to the encounter. You can certainly do that from a, uh, an iPad or something of that nature. Patients can do it from their phone, an iPad, a computer. It works wonderfully. So when the patient logs in, they land on the welcome. And this is everything new. Forms to complete. Messages to respond to. No prescriptions here, but the upcoming appointment, and she doesn't have a balance, so there's no balance showing up. Okay. Now, it calls out where those things are located. So what's new are called out within the menu structure here. Now, from a chart perspective, you can share as little of the chart as you like. So when you complete a clinical note, the summaries appear here. And this is really kind of the list that I've chosen to make available, but problem list, medications, procedures. This would be kind of an overview of what uh, procedures have been performed for the patient. Of course, test results and, and so on. Okay. Two-way messaging capability. Um, kind of, you know, that's that 50-50 in most of my practices. Yes, we love that idea. Others say, yeah, not so much. But true messaging, and this is for non-emergent communication. So a great way to, to remind patients to bring things to their visit, uh, you know, things of that nature. We'll come back to forms here in a moment. But prescribing is a capability here. So there was a prescription written previously, ability to request refill. And the patient can change their primary pharmacy. So if they wanted to change that to a, a Walgreens or whatever, ability to change that readily. Okay. And that updates the medical record, by the way. All appointments are here. So prior appointments listed below, upcoming above. I have capability turned on here to request an appointment. Again, something that some practices embrace, other practices say, hey, not so much. But a capability that you can turn on if you like. And billing. Can't emphasize enough how cool this is. So no responsible party do in this example, but the patient is able to see their statement here. I've got ledger enabled and maybe the only one in the world who has the ledger enabled because none of my practices like that idea, uh, but it is a capability. And online payments, we make it very convenient for patients to pay whether it's point of service in the office, here on the portal, a digital statement, very convenient to pay. If I have a credit card on file, drop this down, hit the submit button, payment is made. It comes right to the office. Okay, so lots of really cool things available in the portal. Let's touch on forms. It's kind of the last piece of this. We're gonna do at least one of these just to show how the data comes in. Two different formats here. And I'm going to touch on the one that's sort of cool and then the one that's really cool. So practice forms, what we have at the bottom here, this is a way to bring in information that is not structured. What I see used most often by existing customers would be the idea of that fillable PDF. So let's just do a, a quick example here to, to illustrate. So that downloaded. Okay, that download button. And by the way, there's an upload button, six o'clock on screen, you see it. 
I'm going to go ahead and touch on the form that, that came in. And this is just an example form. Okay? Where I'm going to go in and you know, complete what is in here and then literally turn around, upload it back, and it comes right into the office. So this is non-structured data, but there's a lot of things that this provides utility for. Consent forms would be one that comes to mind, if nothing else. Get those done before the patient arrives. So put your HIPAA forms out here, have the patient do a signature, because PDF form like this will support a patient signature. So really cool stuff that you can do with this. Now let's go to the forms that are structured data. And I got a couple of examples here, review of systems, social history. Let's complete the review of systems just for fun. I'm gonna touch to complete the form. And as you can see here, this is a very generic review of systems. So I have one set up for all of my different specialties. So this, of course, would be dialed in more for, uh, obviously, your practice specifically. Okay. I'm going to put at least one positive in here so we can see what that's going to look like. And just this easy, I'm done. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and submit the form. What that does is it brings me to a screen here that says it has been submitted. And then it shows that I've completed one form, still have a little work yet to do. And so that's a quick look at Portal. Very functional, simple to use. I can tell you from a practical standpoint, thinking of one customer in particular right now, um, they have a fairly elderly population of patients, internist practice, and they use the Portal to not only communicate with their patients, um, but they do get some amount of uh, throughput with the forms. Right. Push lab results out the whole bit. Quick question on that. When I'm saying the answer is yes, but when the patient fills out all these forms, it automatically populates in their chart, right? Uh, yeah. It's not automatic. It's a, it's a push button. But uh, short answer is basically yes. Okay. okay. And, and the reason I wanted to do one of these forms is so that you could see these responses from the patient are going to come right into the medical record. We're going to push a button. Had I completed both of these forms, all completed forms come in simultaneously. It's one button push, everything comes in. Okay, so yes, you'll see structured data from this, absolutely. Okay, any other questions here? All right, I'm gonna move that off screen here and let's start into a Prima. So quick overview here. This is what we refer to as the desktop screen. When you log into a Prima, this is where you land. Now, the great thing here, everything here is user defined. One exception is that toolbar upper left. That's how we get around. But all the other elements on screen here are your choice. And I mean truly individual user choice. So let's touch on what's here, uh, quick overview. What you have on the left is the calendar. It's one of the ways we represent calendar. And this is ideal for your check-in, check-out, ideal for clinicians and physicians. And those are the kind of groups of people that I see use this view with great frequency. And reason being is because all my check-in, check-out capabilities are here. I can begin clinical notes here, whether I'm a clinician starting the notes or physician taking over. Really, really simple. Okay. Now, I'm only displaying my calendar. I'm displaying a single calendar here, just point of reference, because I'm logged in as a physician. So this is my day today, right? Now, a different view of calendar, blue link, upper left, read calendar. That blue link takes me and it shows me the provider's calendar. Now, let's give this context of a whole work week. Looks like I've not been very busy Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Got a few patients here for Friday. But you get the idea here. Everything on this calendar you define. So the time increments out to the left, the way we've set up some templating on here, which you can see consistency of some follow-up time slots, new patient time slots, uh, a block here at lunch, everything else is open space. I have defined all of those elements based on my own you know, preferences. And, and, and it's very simple for you to do. Something that's done during implementation. 
So this is the calendar typically used for scheduling. Yes, I can actually work from here. I can open new encounters. I can check patients in or check them out. All that I can do uh, otherwise. Okay. But typically we're gonna see a lot of that done from the front screen here. All right, couple pieces to the right. We've got the general inbox on the bottom right. So this is a catch-all inbox. All messages and tasks assigned to me land there. Many of those originate internally. So many that we have here, if I take a phone call and record that for a patient or task someone to do something, uh, a refill request, right? How about getting authorization? Okay, we get a procedure, something that needs insurance authorization. We have tremendous workflow for that to not only capture all of the needed detail, but to dashboard it so that we're aware of how long an authorization may have been pending as we get it approved. Even the ability here to communicate with patients via the portal. Okay, so that's all internal stuff. Outside world, think of things like inbound, outbound facts. That's built into a program. Okay, so you're inbound, outbound. When faxes come in, of course, we can route those documents to anybody that needs to see them and potentially approve of uh, them. Uh, laboratories, imaging, right? So with laboratories, if you do any blood work, certainly that blood work can be over to a laboratory and uh, uh, results coming back into typically the ordering provider. And with imaging, uh, love imaging and PACS integration. Uh, ability typically to feed a PACS system, right? And then access the images stored there. So uh, we'll at least uh, we'll get a good example of that today. So to say that we're connected well with the outside world, absolutely, absolutely. 4,600 interfaces that are up, running, and live today, and that's a huge number. Um, it made, it's, it's a huge number. I mean, that's active interfaces today. So this is the general inbox. Now, here at the top, upper right, the filters that you see actually look like hyperlinks, like, you know, internet links, right? These are filters. So when messages come to me, I have my filtering set up so that if I receive a phone call, every phone call that I need to return goes into its own folder. Yes, they're down here. They're sitting down here uh, ready for me to, to you know, address in the inbox, but the filter actually puts it into its own folder up at the top. So think about that. All my refill requests come to one folder, separate folder for phone calls, separate folder for lab results. So I'm able to see readily how many things are urgent. If my staff has marked anything urgent, what's routine. It's real easy to see what's going on in the inbox. And uh, uh, I've seen many of our providers, users, really take advantage of that. Uh, it can really help you prioritize your day as you kind of work through your messages. So, as this is desktop, uh, pretty straightforward, but again, all user defined, uh, lots of latitude here. So, let me pause for any questions and, and then we'll get into some clinical, I'll actually check in and then we'll do clinical documentation. Okay, quick litmus test. How are we doing so far? Doing good. Good. All right, excellent, excellent. Let's do a quick check-in. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time there. We're gonna stay really physician-focused here because I know uh, you two have to get back to uh, seeing patients here pretty shortly. So, quick check-in is touch of the appointment. All I'm gonna do here, quite literally, is update the status. It'll read checked in, just like so. This is where I can do uh, cash, right? So we're doing co-pays, co-insurance, whatever we need to do as far as uh, insurance goes but I can take those dollars here readily. I also see any outstanding balance. So this is related to today and the E&M that we generate today. And the bottom portion of the screen focuses on any outstanding balance. Uh, nothing is patient responsible for this patient. There's 215 out to insurance currently. Okay. And, and kind of nice that you're able to see at the very top of the screen, my patient is Karen Berlin. She's a female, age 52, and she has Aetna PPO 25 insurance. So that header is always present when you have a patient open, and that grouping of really colorful icons at the top there, every one of them has function. 
So when you have a patient open, literally in one touch, you can land anywhere else in the patient's record. It's really nice because you don't have to use all these drop down menus and different things to navigate. If I wanna to go to her demographics, touch and I'm there. I wanna go into the medical chart, I'm there. Uh, I wanna go into history where I can see prescriptions and all those things, one touch and I'm in her. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and say, let's check her in. You see the time that she's checked in. All right, as we build a clinical note, you guys have mentioned that you're pretty comfortable at least been using uh, point click and, and I think some typing maybe to, to capture some of the uh, color type of narrative. So in a Prima, based on your preferences, we can set you up to do more structured data, that's what you're currently doing, or optimize your documentation for more narrative, as it's personal preference there. So we can we can really optimize the product based on your own personal preferences and guess what you don't have to agree on it okay. it's kind of nice when you have that option to really dial it in for you and that's a good thing now i'm going to kind of go at least to start out here structured data route uh, we are going to pull in that questionnaire from the portal as we document for this first patient okay so let's go ahead and get started here this initiates the, the clinical note. Now, workflow wise, do you all typically have a nurse or maybe an MA who would see the patient prior to you? What, what's kind of the workflow from check in? Yeah, the MA will bring them back and then they'll start the interview and get some of the chief complaint and all that stuff. And they'll start the note um, initially and then they'll come bring us in and then we'll kind of take it from there. Okay, perfect. Perfect. All right, that, that's a pretty common workflow. Uh, if you want, we can emulate that here today or we can simply just kind of go through the note. Do you have a, do you have a preference? Um, let's just go through the note. Okay, so let's do a little bit of navigation up front. Let's talk about the way we can document and then I'm gonna go straight through a note beginning to end. So I'm gonna kind of tee it up and, and then execute on it. So commonly when your nurse or MA would, would uh, begin with the patient, this would be teed up here to vitals. And whatever information you capture as far as vitals, uh, absolutely. Things like shoe size or other vitals that you want to capture that are maybe non-traditional, uh, absolutely can. Plenty of room for custom vitals, okay? But now let's do some navigation. Navigationally, there's two things that'll make this all very, very simple. One is that I'm gonna to work top to bottom, left to right. Okay? Everything I do pretty much begins upper left, I'm gonna work my way down. Oftentimes my menu is here at the left, everything I'm entering is to the right. So it follows that pattern of, of movement consistently. Okay? The other piece here is soap. We're all familiar with the soap note, so let's draw the soap note out. My complaint and history of complaint. So CC and HPI. And I'm pointing up at that dark row that grows across the top here. So CC and HPI. Move over to objective. There's my exam. Assessment is here at DX. Leading up to plan are prescriptions, procedures, orders, and there's your plan. So linear format, really following a soap note through. Okay. Uh, Couple pieces here that, that are helpful. We can drive the note by complaint, and I'm gonna to touch on these here for a minute. Okay. We have a lot of complaints that are built in. So when I look at all of the foot and ankle related complaints, or orthopedic related complaints here, uh, there's a lot of pre-built content. So there's two ways that this works. One is that I can use that structured data, so I can click the mouse or touch the screen, make selections, or if I wanna simply do narrative, so let me put in, say, foot pain as an example. I can type or talk here all I want. I leave it up to you guys, plain and simple. Okay, I'm gonna erase the complaint for just a minute. Let's go over here to palettes. So this is two of three. So when I look at palettes, palettes are, it's our cute word for templates. So in a primary, we've called them palettes forever. Uh, I really look at that as saying, okay, our templates are really stackable. I can use multiple templates to build a clinical note. In other words, kind of stack them up. So maybe that I mean by palettes, but the net of it is, is that 
your templates can be as narrow or broad as you like. And just to give a little perspective here, this is my ankle sprain template. But let's open that up to modify it. I'm going to kind of move this over just a little bit. All of the different elements you see here can be incorporated into a template. They don't have to be, they can be. So the complaint and history of complaint, the problem focused review of systems, exam, okay, and which can be, of course, problem focused. I can put diagnosis, prescriptions, procedures and orders in, plan notes, patient instruction. It can be a lot. And guys, with templates, chart it and save it. And yes, you have a template. Literally document it, save your documentation. That becomes a template. So here you can see just a simple example of, of the template. Now, how I save these, when I do clinical documentation, upper left-hand corner, I save it as what we refer to as a common problem palette or template, and then it'll join the list here. I'll take today's visit and I'll do a template out of it, okay? and you'll see how that works. All right, lastly is follow-up. So upper right, this time the last time I saw this patient was back in 2015, okay? So in follow-up, you can pull forward any element of a prior note it does not have to be the whole prior note pick any element you want pick the whole thing if you like but the way you do it simply is that the check boxes that you see here that is what i'm pulling forward when i create the new note really simple to do yes you can combine all three approaches i can see a patient in follow-up also address a new complaint and i can drop the template in there too if i wanted it so they all work together. It's really you using the product in the way that's best, most efficient for you. Okay. All right, I'm gonna do a complaint-driven note today. I'm skipping vitals. We'll go back to that, you know, it's a, it's a simple thing to enter. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, if you look at it at nine o'clock, you can see from the calendar, a Prima is a single product, office visit brief, complaint of foot pain. So there we have right from the calendar. So let's go ahead and put foot paint in. I'm gonna move one step forward here to HPI. And remember, I'm working top to bottom, left to right. So there's foot pain. Here are my categories of findings. They follow CMS guidelines, so pretty cool. Those categories appear three at a time to the right. All right, everybody sees kind of the heavy green box around quality. That's in the pole position here. In timing of episodes, onset resolution, they're right next door. So when I touch on severity, it hits the pole position, the two below, right next door. So instead of having to go through tree ladder stuff or pop-up windows or cascades of things, this gives me a way to really document quickly and efficiently. And guys, as I go through this, the idea is not to complete every category. That's silly. It's here because who knows where the patient's journey is going to take us. So that's the whole idea behind it. Right, so Quick question, sorry, yeah. um, as you're doing that, and I, I assume this is how it works, but there's codes attached to all of this stuff of clicking, right, that comes through somewhere? One more time, because your voice kind of kind of faded on me a little bit. Oh, sorry. Um, there are codes that are attached to all this stuff, so do the diagnosis codes and procedure codes come through as they're picking all of the things that show up in their note? Is it through? Actually, they can. Is it okay. is set up that way out of the box? It is not. But as I work through history of present illness here and I document the note uh, behind what we see here, you can actually have diagnosis and or procedure codes that are sitting behind here that uh, would automatically be added to the note today. I see that oftentimes with well visits. Uh, I see that oftentimes with screening like a dad that foot exam, that type of thing, where I may want the code simply to be in here because I'm documenting that exam today. So you do have the ability to do that. And it's very simple to set up. Okay. Were, were you asking specifically in this section or just when they select the diagnosis and the procedure codes that they end up on a super bill or claim when they're done? Um, probably either. Just some of times when we've had 
you provided to support like a peer audit or something I want to see the codes that go in with the notes so if it wasn't there I just I you would it would be more complicated I guess to pull but I'm sure you can find the data in well, multiple yeah I mean since, since this is one system for practice management EHR when John gets through the note the the super bill will automatically be available to look at it'll show all the codes that are selected so it's instantaneous that you can review that. You can link back into the note if you want to review what was actually documented. So again, it's one, one application to just kind of go anywhere. And then if there was ever an audit, there's a full audit trail of who documented, who read, who viewed, who added or modified information. Okay, well, I assume you show us then what it looks like to select the codes and generate the super bill. Oh, absolutely. Okay, all good. Absolutely. Keep going. Sorry. <laughs> all right. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm actually going to go through the whole note. So let's hold questions literally for just a couple of minutes. The reason I ask, and it's a simple one, I want you to get the idea of the flow. And um, it's important to kind of get that perspective, I think. So I'm going to run it through. It'll be fairly quick to do so. And uh, we'll go back and put some extra emphasis on the coding piece of this in any other area that you really want me to dig into. Happy to do it. So I'm gonna just put in enough here to kinda, kinda get this thing rolling. Say it's worse during the day. Let's say this started, oh, I don't know, about four or five weeks ago. Okay. I'm gonna leave it at that as far as what we are inputting, at least as, as his uh, uh, API goes. Let's touch review systems. Notice nothing documented. Up here at the top, about top dead center, is my icon that drives the import of all the patient responses. So just a single touch up. I would imagine your MA would do this at the beginning of the visit. That's a real common approach because it pulls in all of the questionnaires, whether there's one or many, okay? And confirmation that it's in. Now I'm gonna move this just a little bit here. You can see, we do the bold on the positives and text on the negatives, okay? And I'm just gonna put here left foot. Okay, all right, let's move on to the exam. So I've got my exam set up up here and typically what I see is that most of my physicians are gonna use uh, a format here where they can drop in normal findings, pre-populate everything that's going to be examined with normal findings, at least first time they perform the exam. And then from that, they'll go in and, and move on to uh, picking out the positives. Okay. So I'm going to move here to the lower left. Our foot. See those redness and swelling. I'm not going to get deep, deep, deep into all the different findings here, You'll see, you know, as far as uh, all of the different findings, normal findings in the exam are plain, like the top two here, whereas my positives are nice and bold. So they show up in, in the note this way. Uh, any correspondence you send out to maybe a specialist or sending something back to um, primary care are going to carry the same kind of formatting. Okay. So documenting, obviously, here to the level of detail necessary. I'm going to move over here to codes. Okay, so my patient had plantar fibromatosis as their previous diagnosis. I've got a, a list of codes that are set up here as kind of my quick reference list. You see all of those codes here. Now, yes, there's a mix of codes in here that are nines and tens. This provider was set up back in the days of ICD nines. Every time I use a 10 code that replaces a nine, it actually replaces an on-screen here. So it's pretty cool the way it works. I'm going to go ahead and use the, the code here. I'm going to dig for specificity just a little deeper. So plantar fibromatosis. Go ahead and open this up. It looks like that's as a specific code as I can get. Okay, so I don't see anything here that shows that I can dig for a more specific code. We'll do an example here in just a couple minutes so that we can do that. Um, there's 
some icons that drive the screen here that show me when I'm using a non-specific code versus specific code. I don't have a specific code here because I don't have anything uh, flagging. In the instance of prescribing, uh, if we're writing any kinds of prescriptions, the prescribe button is almost center screen, nice and blue. Any reason a controlled substance is written, access to your state controlled substance database is this link at nine o'clock. That'll open up all states subscribed to in a single view. Literally, you're in the view as soon as you click the link. It does all of the uh, pass through kind of things that need to be done. Okay. I'll go ahead and write a script here real quick just to give you a sense of what it looks like. So shows here that the naprosim was written previously. Of course, I can use a search capability here to find anything that I need to write. Let's just do a refill here. Oh, we don't want to do that. Let's do a different prescription. Let me do, um, do an approximate. So let's do a 250 milligram tablet. I'm gonna go ahead and use my dosing suggestions here and just do a standard dose. And let's dig into the SIG detail here. One tablet hourly, twice daily. Let's do a two week supply with no refills. So that's written. Now let's touch on a couple things here real quick. Formulary capability is built in. So this pharmacy, the CVS pharmacy that's middle of the screen, when I open this up, it's pointing to that pharmacy. It'll give me copay information for that pharmacy, formulary related alternatives, and if prior authorization is needed, it'll be flagged. It'll let me know that. If I wanna get the medication through prior auth, the EPA button here at the top reads EPA, nice red arrow. That's how we start prior auth, push the button. It initiates it. You'll get an electronic response, a form to complete back from the formulary. You'll complete it and send it back through the formulary. Within an hour, typically, you get your yes or no. Okay. And of course, this uh, screens for uh, medications, uh, contraindications, allergies, uh, all the things that drug screening needs to do. That's all done in one. Okay. So I have to save the script and that's ready to go to the CVS pharmacy. Procedures and orders, your procedures are reimbursable. So anything you're doing in office that lands on a claim that is reimbursable, we call that a procedure. Orders are not reimbursable. So if I'm sending out, say, a CT, be a good example, an MRI, a blood work that I need to get done, okay, those would be non-reimbursable, Orders, in other words, okay? So common orders, uh, those get tracked. So we have a dashboard for all of your labs and imaging studies that go outside the building. Those go to a single dashboard where they can be tracked to make sure responses, uh, results come back. If you're referring patients for any reason, referrals are tracked on their own dashboard. Okay? And then we get to plan here, plan's the last piece. Patient instruction and plan. There's a couple different fields here to, to capture information. I'm going to use a macro here. And uh, let's say that we're going to have the uh, rice therapy. Okay. So I want my patient to, to be doing this uh, on a regular basis. That's all pre-written. All I had to do was touch the link. And that's instruction now that will uh, print or go to portal at the close of the note. Go ahead and pull forward my, my diagnosis code here. And can articulate my plan. Okay, let's see the patient follow up in two weeks. All right, I'm gonna display the note and then go back through a couple of things here just to give some context. So what we select as narrative, all those different items that I selected in HPI, they give me a really nice narrative here. Okay. Notice how your positives show here in context to the negatives. And the same type of thing is what we see here in the exam. So any of the positives will show as bold, negatives is plain text. All right, kind of moving down here to diagnosis, prescribing, and so on. This will generate a claim that's going to include both what's here 
And of course, again, then when we select that, course instruction and so on. All right. Now, let me go back and touch on a couple of things, just uh, interest of time and make sure that we do get in all of the things that we want to get in today. I'm gonna come back over here to procedures. Let's touch down here on diabetic foot exam. Got a couple different things that are set up here to uh, be procedure notes. So procedure notes in a Prima, there's a couple different ways they can be done. Uh, we have what's called a dynamic procedure note. Why it's dynamic is that a lot of things can occur with that. A great example would be um, messaging tasking or generation of a document. By selecting a dynamic procedure note, I can task members of my staff to do things automatically. I can generate documents that may be needed for some reason automatically. Then we have the good old fashioned procedure note and uh, basically it's, it's the variables. So you've got to block the text that is the note itself and you simply address the variables. You can save defaults, you know, things that might be kind of consistent most of the time uh, and, and always alter or change. Uh, but yeah, the default piece of it you can save in, it's really nice, it can really save a lot of time uh, in addressing uh, those kinds of things. So let me touch on one that's dynamic first. Okay. That procedure note is sitting upper left-hand corner. There's a kind of a bluish white cylinder. And when I touch on that, it opens up the procedure note. Now in this, I don't have any defaults that are saved. So this is a diabetic foot exam. Okay? And, and it's going to be the questions here to the left, responses here to the right. Now, wonderful thing is, is when I build this, yes, I can save default responses built in. That's provider preference. So you guys can kind of determine how you want to populate this up front. And if you, you know, kind of that uh, lowest common denominator, if the answers are pretty consistent most of the time, it's less items that you need to address. Okay. So I'll go through and just touch on a few of these. I think you'll get the idea pretty, pretty quick. I think these are mostly uh, yes, no responses. Let me say okay here. Let's do a little refresh on our note. So it kind of just sets up in that fashion. Okay, so that's one of the ways of doing it. There is an additional way. I think my other one is set up is kind of our old school format. Nope, this is set up as dynamic as well. And again, up here at the upper left, when I make my responses, I can actually use the button in the upper left to create a template. So if I see there's consistency, kind of a common way the procedure ends up most of the time, I can actually save it uh, as a template so that I don't have to do all the input each time. So kind of cool. Okay, let's remove that item from there. All right, uh, let me double check here. I want to make sure that I have a provider here. I'm pretty sure that I do, but just want to be certain. I don't. I'm going to set up our PCP real quick. Put Dr. Patterson in here. Okay, uh, he's a primary care physician. And uh, I'm going to pick a consult letter that he's going to receive every time that we generate a note. So let me do my consult letter here in the two column version. That's a really good looking letter. Now, what I did here, and this is something your MA would ordinarily do, is I've set up a relationship here. This is my referring doctor, the primary care physician for Karen. And every time we see the patient, we wanna make sure he gets correspondence. So when I do this as a one-time setup, Upon completion of the clinical note, it will auto-generate a consult letter going back to Dr. Patterson that will go either as a direct mail or as a fax. You don't have to do your letters separately. The system will generate automatically and send them and do the proper disclosure in the record so that you don't have to do that either. All right, let's take our visit text here. We're good there. Let's touch on E&M. E&M is kind of really the last piece here. 
And a couple pieces here I really want to highlight. We did not document a couple elements of the note. So there was no history documented. Vitals were not taken. So when we go here to the e &M calculator, it's kind of a summary screen. It shows you what's been done, shows you what has not been addressed. So based on all the factors here, of course, we're doing a, a brand new patient because 2015 is the last time we saw them. Uh, you got everything you need here. Now, 2021 standard. Are you guys familiar with the uh, new e &M guidelines? It's really quiet. Oh, you know what? Um, I'm going to go with no. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Guys, right now it's a Medicare thing, okay? Um, I'm not a coder, so I'm not going to represent myself as being a coder. 2021, January 1, new e &M guidelines took effect for Medicare patients. And you guys know that what Medicare commonly does, our commercial payers will typically follow suit. So today, this guideline only affects office-based patients, Medicare only, but check your local payers because your local payers, commercial payers, may be adopting the new standard. It gets rid of all of this bullet uh, kind of counting, all this counting up stuff. It eliminates that. And what it does is it either works based on complexity or it works on the amount of time spent with a patient. There's some reading to do behind this. CMS has some, a couple of documents that are pretty concise. They're, they're easy reads, in other words, you know, over a cup of coffee kind of read. Uh, but I would encourage, take a peek. Um, very helpful to, to know what's going on with that because uh, for our new guidelines in effect, we've already addressed those. Okay. Let me go ahead and hit the couple pieces here. Because those are omissions, let's get our full credit today. So let me touch on vitals. It takes me right back to here. I'm gonna put in just enough information to have credit here. So let's say blood pressure is nice and normal, like so. And from history, let's just touch a couple categories that we reviewed the medication list, we reviewed the problem list, and let's just say from drug allergy standpoint, uh, patient tells us no issues with medications. So now when I touch back on the e &M, you'll see nothing red. Okay, let me remove that and go back to documentation. So I've got a detailed history and a detailed exam of moderate complexity, level three visit. Okay. The note is done. It is, it is ready to go. Okay. Nice looking note all the way through. All right, now what do we do next? We close the note. So bottom right hand corner, there's an OK button. I'm going to touch on that. And what this does is it opens up a, a window that shows me uh, that I can keep the note open if I want to go document some more. You know, maybe there's something left to finish, busy day, or mark it as complete. And right about center screen, you see a button that reads complete. So I'm going to touch on that. That told billing, this note is ready to review. That told billing, this is a claim ready to go. By virtue of documenting the clinical note, we are creating the claim. They're tied together. We're encounter-driven. So the creation of the clinical note also creates the claim. And there's your claim ID number. It's 1508. So I'm going to say OK here to close out. I'm going to complete the note. What we have happening here is the medication automatically goes out to the pharmacy. And Dr. Patterson's going to get his consult letter automatically. So I say OK here, and all that magic happens. So next step here, what happens, and this, is, this would be a background thing, but because of the way I have this set up for demonstration purposes, I get an extra window here. This would not be popping up to, to kind of interrupt workflow in your world. And here's the reason why. Uh, automatically, this would be tagged to go as a fax or as a direct message. They're grayed out. I don't have them installed in this particular database. I have mine set up to print because everybody says, well, what's the consult letter look like? So it gives me a way to share that with you. But what this does is it looks to Dr. Frank, uh, Dr. Patterson in the database. It would look for his direct mail uh, address. If he has one, great. This letter goes as direct mail. If not, it'll bounce over here to fax and go as a fax. Okay. 
So I'm gonna let that happen. We'll give this just a second because that letter is gonna generate uh, to a file that we'll be able to see here in just a moment. And uh, then we'll do the checkout. And uh, I know we're coming up on time here just a little bit. So let me go ahead and just save that. And I'll pop up on the screen here. There we go. So this letter format is one that uh, a lot of our practices really like. Um, pretend that's your letterhead, okay? Uh, this would be formatted in a way that would uh, be very attractive, you know, going out as correspondence from you. All of what we have here as far as um, history would be to the left. All of our findings here to the right, like so. And uh, our letters typically are one to two pages max. So I don't know how that compares to what you're getting uh, inbound from other systems, but every day I see other systems that are generating, no kidding, letters that are eight and 10 and 12 pages long, full of, forgive me, a lot of useless information or not so pertinent information. So you guys control all the formatting here. Uh, this can read just like a letter if that's your preference. You know, thank you for your kind of referral. Um, here are my findings today. You know, here's my assessment, here's my plan. It can be that direction if you prefer. Okay, move this fella over here off the screen. And uh, I'm gonna go back into the note for a minute. Um, there was a question asked about how do we find codes? How do we make it simple? And, and I wanna go back and just highlight something real quick. We'll go ahead and just open a new note for Mr. Jeffrey here. So what I'll do is uh, touch to open here. This is gonna go direction here just to, to show a couple of uh, cool functions. Uh, orders workflow and, and a couple of things here. So with ICD-10, we commonly build in a quick reference list for you. You guys will determine what's here. Uh, we can break this into categories, whether it be, you know, toes, you know, foot, ankle, whatever the case might be. You'll determine if we want to have some categories that sit over to the left and then the exact codes that'll be over to the right. Okay. Um, I'm going to touch on something here. I'm hoping I'm going to get something with a little bit of, yeah, I'm not getting any of what I'm looking for here. Help me with a code that would be a non-specific code that you guys use where, you know, laterality comes into play, that type of thing. Maybe sprain of the ankle or foot? Do angle fracture. Like, any of the fracture codes are all like that. Okay. My sprains are good, too. <laughs> I'm seeing. <laughs> all right. Here's what I was looking for. Um, the do not enter sign to the left there, right? It's orange, but it's got kind of that symbol that looks like do not enter. Tells me I have a non-specific code. Okay. Then we get what we call the building blocks here. I call it the Tetris cubes, but that'll tell you how old I am as well. So when I touch on the building blocks, what this does is it gives me all of the different factors that help me narrow specificity. Here they're called modifiers. I think it's confusing when we look at coding overall. I kind of call them qualifiers, but if I'm seeing the patient for an initial encounter, and this happens to be related to the left foot, there we go. There's my specific code. So it differs from what's at the left. An eight, I'm sorry, an S93.609A. Yeah, there's my specific code. So that will get you paid. Now, when the patient comes back, you know, subsequent visit, then sequela visit, you're going to still be changing those codes. And when you select the old code, it opens up the same kind of capability and you're able to put in the appropriate code. Okay, so we have a partner that, uh, that we work with on this. This is called Intelligent Medical Objects. And uh, we've had their database in a Prima since ICD-9s. It's been a long time. Uh, really, really great way to be able to easily find the codes that you're looking for. Okay, so simply touch OK, and that's added into the encounter. Uh, one piece on here I realized I didn't touch into, which is orders workflow. There's a couple different ways to go about this. And uh, I'm going to touch on the simple way and then a way that's uh, got a, maybe a couple other steps involved in it. From a procedure standpoint, anything that you do in-house that is reimbursable, again, we call that a procedure. And so if we were performing something like an injection, right, 
Um, all I have to do is select it. It's going to be added to the claim. And if it's got a dynamic procedure note behind it, things can happen in the background. A great example might be if this were an x-ray, I'm sending a task automatically to my x-ray tech. They know a patient's coming down to get a film done, right? So just selection of the code itself can drive things to occur in the background. So really simple, clean way to do this. Now from an orders perspective, Let's say I want to handle it, I have some, percent of, some percentage of patients that uh, somehow duck out the door before they get their x-ray. And I want to make sure that we're truly capturing uh, appropriate revenue and that we don't make a mistake and bill for something <laughs> that didn't occur. So in the idea of an order, I can set this up as an x-ray to order. This can do the same magic of sending a task down to my x-ray tech. My x-ray tech wants the service is rendered to the patient, we'll mark it as a billable service. So in the process of the workflow, it's a push basically that now drops this from being a non-reimbursable order, it'll actually pop over into the procedure tab by virtue of the button push and now becomes billable. So depending on, on kind of what your workflows are, uh, what your maybe um, you know, concerns would be from, from prior uh, experience, you know, this can be set up in a couple of different ways, purely based on your preference of workflow. Okay. I know we're kind of coming up on the hour here, roughly 15, maybe 10 minutes, uh, doctors, before you need to go back for patients. And my goal was to leave a little bit of time in between just uh, to hit some Q&A. Um, I'm going to open the floor to you all and, uh, you know, what do you think? Uh, give me some feedback, if you would. We've got a couple questions. Uh, one is, um, can there be more than one person in, in the note doing stuff at once? Uh, in the active clinical note, one at a time. In the medical record, no limit. Um, then as far as when you did on the, the tab of the visit text, it showed us the kind of the text. Um, do we have the ability to open it up and edit it? You can't edit the text that is here, but fields can be added here for you to add additional information into. So this is really more of a display of output is the intent of this. We have a different documentation capability within a Prima that gives you all kind of free text capability uh, different from this. Can you show that to me? I don't know if I have it set up for this patient. Let me just double check and see if I can set up. I probably have a generic set up. Let me add, I'm going to add a configuration here real quick. Hey, John, while you're doing that, just talk about workflow and multiple people being in the, in the visit. Um, you can have people that are entering results or updating histories outside of the clinical note. So, in, in that kind of workflow, multiple people can be um, in, in that patient's chart, so to speak. They can't have somebody entering vitals and then somebody adding, adding you know, physical exam at, at the same time. So they could be adding physical exam and I could be clicking on diagnosis codes or at the same time? No, just just the history sections or or result related information could be entered in. Okay. So quick example here. This is a different format of documentation, more of a dashboard approach. Uh, came a, about as a collaboration with uh, one of our, our larger customers. And the idea behind this is to to give you more space to do just a lot of narrative. Now, you're not limited to narrative because here there's the ability to go in and do um, either dot phrases or macros, if you will, and uh, okay. those can be all over the map. So as I kind of move through this, you can see you know, a patient story here, any activity that occurs since the last visit, and you can see there was a refill request, a means to select problems you know, or diagnosis. So this is the mm -hmm. patient problem list, and anything that I touch and select here is added to today's encounter. 
There are disease specific tiles here. Uh, these are designed to show disease status essentially. So you can pull in uh, various different kinds of uh, uh, observations, whether those be vitals, lab results, and, and really bring everything together here as more of a dashboard kind of approach. And as I move down to the documentation capability, let's go beyond medications here. This is where all the documentation is done. So this is set up as more of a uh, component of the note. Uh, some of my practices have done this as subjective, objective, and plan. I've seen this, the capability here is, is you, can, you can do this in many ways. And when I go in and put notes in, the dot phrases are really kind of cool because the dot is a period and I put a P in. So dot P, these are my macros and just that easy, I can drop an exam in. Now this is a really great way to document if you're someone who is inclined to type or this is fantastic for voice recognition. So in a voice recognition capability, I'd simply come in and drop the cursor here, and I would call as a voice command the exam that I want to document. It gives me all of the different body systems bracketed in with normals, and I simply key down to the point where I want to you know, input some uh, positives and do that with detail, and then simply close it. And it'll drop all of that in and you can create unlimited numbers of these kinds of macros, you know, for all different kinds of problem focused exams, that type of thing. So really nice way to do the documentation. So we've got two real primary ways of doing this, more of this dashboarded approach, uh, more of the structured data. Um, we really leave it up to you all to determine uh, what you like best, what will work best, you know, individually for you. And if you share patients, the way the note reads, the way the note looks, it doesn't matter whether I document this way or with more structured data, the note still lays out formats uh, in, in a very similar uh, fashion. Okay. And then there's a capability to uh, if a patient's, you know, we see them the first time for plantar fasciitis and then they're coming back for follow-up, we can create a new note from an old note. Absolutely. When it pulls in most of the stuff, we can just update it. You can pull in any, any element of prior documentation to start your, your today note. Okay. Yep. Literally the entire thing or specific element, your choice. Whatever you kind of set up as your pattern, it remembers that for next time. So if you're consistent in the way you build your follow-up notes, um, you don't have to reset or make choices each time. You make it once and it'll hold that unless you change your preferences and then it'll, that'll be your new preferences. So yeah, really great follow-up capability. And then with you, you said the interfaces, you guys have interfaced with like Simon Med imaging and like a external request. That, is that what you're talking about, the interfaces? Yeah, interfaces, um, your standard laboratories, Quest, LabCorp, you know, we've done those a zillion times. Okay. Max integration, um, knowing the devices that you have or the interfaces that you need, uh, would like to have, um, many we've done already. So it makes it easier just to kind of replicate and, and, and activate that for you, if you will. Okay. And then if we want to like incorporate a photo that we take of like an ulcer or something, that we yeah. can do that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it'll attach right to the, uh, the encounter note itself. Hey, Nate, do you have any questions? Uh, not really, I'm just trying to take everything in. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> you know what, to, to do this much inside of an hour's time, and you guys are already thinking about, hey, who's my next patient? Uh, totally get it. Totally get it. I think the one takeaway is there is a lot of flexibility in terms of how you may want to approach your, your documentation, maybe from one patient to the next or one type of encounter. Again, new patient versus follow-up. Um, you can kind of define what works best for you. 
yeah, it does seem like it's very flexible and uh, whatever technique or whatever kind of style you're, you're used to, you can, you have an option to, to set it up that way for yourself. Yep. So I have another question, um, just real quick. So with, like, let's say we have a patient and we want them to bring with them their shoes next visit and we send them an email in the portal. Does the portal email them in their email to say, check your portal? It does. Okay, good. It does. Yeah, so when you send a message out to the portal, uh, email's not required, by the way. We get that question about the portal all the time. But why it helps, why it's important is exactly what you're asking because they get an email that says, check the portal. There's something important for you there. So it's, it's a HIPAA compliant way in the mass communication to say, check your portal where there may be something that's HIPAA protected. So they do get an email heads up to check the portal for, for information. Okay. Hey John, just before the, the the doctors have to go to see patients, just yeah. just want to quick show them that the super bills completed. You know when they're done with the note. It is so. From a billing perspective, billing is built in. It's all one product, and so track super bills is kind of the beginning point for things billing. Now the claim that I generated for my first patient, Karen, is actually sitting in queue here. So it generated the claim and let me filter to today's super bills. Okay. Here's the claim for Karen Berlin. It is in the ready to review status. So literally I complete the note, the claim is ready. So here, I'm gonna open this up just because I think it'd be good for everybody just to see. This includes everything that was documented. So this is what we call an electronic super bill. It's not the actual formatted, you know, uh, 1500 form. As you can see here, the diagnosis I picked, remember I did the foot exam plus the e &M. You can move things around and change how things are uh, uh, here. The clinical note, top dead center guys, that blue button, here's the clinical note to support what we have on screen. So as I go through and review billing, how about that? Okay, so everything is here. Now we have a scrubbing capability here where I can validate this claim. It'll look for all information that should be present, make sure it's here so that, uh, you know, the claims going out uh, with obviously a better chance to be, uh, you know, complete and thorough uh, first time around. So some really, really good components that are built in here, but this is where we get to the claim. So again, I was in what we call track super bills, all the claims for the day will line up here. I can review them all at once, a little bit here or there through the day. Um, they go literally from kind of this point in the product out through the clearinghouse. And each claim is statused. I'm circling ready to review status on this. They're status from the time that they're created, new charges, through full reimbursement. And within a Prima, those statuses change as we work the claims. And when they leave the office and go out through the clearinghouse onto the payer, EDI messaging routes back into a Prima and continues to update the claim status. So you're getting real-time status of the claim as it goes through its life cycle. And you have all touches to the claim are captured in the claim's history. So history is a part of the claim, blue button that I've highlighted. Um, that captures every single touch, including EDI messages associated to this claim. So rich history right here in a Prima. Some yeah. tremendous advantages. Got a quick question. So uh, mm -hmm. as far as, let's say that I, I see a patient, they have plantar fasciitis, I do an EM code, an e &M code, I do x-rays and I do an injection. Mm -hmm. um, the note's not finished, it's incomplete. The patient's leaving, they're gonna check out, but, but I want them to check out, but I wanna basically collect their copay or deductible. Um, am I able to enter in my charges and then just complete, complete the rest of it later, but then that would allow the front office to check them out and collect the money? Yes. 
So here's checkout window, all right? I touched on this from my desktop screen. There's a charge estimate, okay? The charge estimate pulls from a number of factors in a Prima. It pulls from the eligibility 271 response file. That's gonna have your co-pays in it, co-insurance percentage if applicable. It's gonna have deductible information in it. Okay. So as I go down through what's chargeable in here, the zero dollar charge for that foot exam. But let's go down here to the ENM. There you go. It breaks it out. So okay. it looks to your fee schedule, it looks to the amount allowed or contractual schedule, overlays the patient situation, which is all that eligibility stuff, and gives you a good sense of what is due. So you can collect at the time of service at checkout, you can collect what's due. Okay. I'll give yeah, you one good. other option there. Our credit card integration will allow for credit card to be kept on file and you can gain consent from the patient to charge the card to an agreed upon amount on a monthly basis. So 200, 300, whatever that amount is, once you get consent, it's good for a year. Our best financially performing practices have already done that. And guys, it's the Amazon generation if your paradigm shift still says, I'll gladly pay you for the hamburger on Tuesday that I'm eating today, um, Amazon has changed the way our patients think. Uh, they, they will actually give you that kind of uh, capability. So you get some great tools here to, to, to get patient portion up front or literally as it's built out and becomes patient responsible. Okay, that makes sense. And Brad, I'm thinking this is almost, I mean, this is just an electronic version of that encounter form, it sounds like. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop off, and I think Dr. Jepson will. Um, if, Kylie, you want to go over some of those other questions, you can. we got to get to some patients here. Thank you both for your time. Yeah, thank you. Doctors, for thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. So um, one of my questions was the staff was wondering if the system has any sort of like cancellation list built into it where they can add a patient waiting to get an appointment on whatever day and if someone cancels would it notify them that there's an open spot and who was next in line or any type of like that? That's a great question. Let's touch on calendar. We do have a means to work with that. So there's something here called waiting list. It is not an automated function. The way this works, let's say I've got a patient here who wants to get in. Okay? So I put them into the waiting list. Mm -hmm. Now a spot opens up on here. Whoever's at the top of my list would be the one that I want to get into that appointment slot, okay? I can have notes with the patient on the waiting list to indicate, hey, this, one, this patient wants to get in the, uh, in the morning, you know, sooner than later, you know, if you're booked up for weeks on end. You literally can drag from the waiting list right onto the calendar. Oh, perfect. And if they have a, an appointment later on, does it cancel the and, and put them in instead? Um, it wouldn't cancel the future appointment necessarily because okay. if I put them from the calendar and put them on the waiting list or if I create somebody new to be on the waiting list, um, it may not, and I don't, I don't believe it automatically cancels a future appointment. John, it, it doesn't, but you can quickly see if the patient has any future appointments, you know, from that little, you know, kind of hover window. Okay, well, that makes yeah. sense. Then you just cancel the future one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there's a need to do so, exactly. Okay. Um, another one was, say, in the beginning where patients have the chance to put in their own information, such as, like, whatever medications they're on, um, oftentimes, well, is, is that optional, or do they have to say, no, I'm not on any, or what? Because oftentimes the patient will just 
decide not to put them in and then bring in whatever their own paper list. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I guess in that situation, the staff was curious. I think a few of them have worked with other um, platforms that pulled the patient's medications just straight from their pharmacy. Yeah, so we don't give the patient the ability to put their own medications in. So that's the one piece of history that um, we have stayed away from as far as patient okay. goes. Patients can actually input all of the other history elements, medications being the exception. Okay, um, so the staff would be responsible for that portion. Yeah, so let's, let's touch on that, though. I want to I give you some positive on that, okay? So when I touch here to medication history, you can see my patient's got uh, a couple of active medications here, a bunch of inactive stuff down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. We're with SureScripts. So when I look at bringing medications in, SureScripts has on record everything that's been paid for using insurance. So here's what uh, is on record. Here's what I have as active meds in the patient's list. So all I have to do is touch on anything that I want to bring into history and oh, say, perfect. add it in. Now, I want you to see something real quick. When I touch on these, look at the detail that you get. Your staff would never spend the time, and, and I'm saying not singling you guys out, but as a general rule, they're gonna put in patients taking Humulin, and it may simply be that, <laughs> right? Yeah. This is, this is giving you all of the detail, where it was prescribed, who wrote the script, um, all the SIG detail, you know, exactly how this was dispensed. It gives you all of that, even though you're not asking for it. Yeah. So tremendous. The fact that you can pick the meds that you wanna to add to the list, it is is so nice. Um, a lot of systems. Very nice. Some people have very large amount of medication. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, isn't that the truth? <laughs> yeah. So really easy way to do it. Um, lots of detail, very quickly, and it queues up based on calendar. So you know, with your patients in the calendar, it it literally has kind of all that teed up and and ready to go, so that. Uh, when you open up the patient's history, you can review the med list and simply click on the ones you want to bring in as you go through it. It, it makes it a lot faster. Perfect. Um, those were the two main ones I had. Did you have any, Nicole? Um, I just have a couple on um, the process of transitioning to this. So, I mean, years of Optimizations built into LiTech MD and into the scheduling side on LiTech for visit type and um, different templates in the progress codes. Uh, I don't know. There's just there's a lot of stuff we've just for time built out. What's the process for switching? Do you guys are you able to sort of like copy some of the stuff that we have, or do we have to literally from scratch about every section in here? Paul, do you want to address or do you want me to handle? Um, so obviously any implementation is going to take time to um, go from contract to, to go live. I would estimate probably 90 days just to be safe with, with that type okay. of project just for okay. planning purposes. Um, from a data conversion, um, we can send you the, the list just so you have it, but just high level, you know, the patient demographics are gonna come through with, with all this various, you know, chart number, social, date of birth, address, phone numbers. Um, there are future booked appointments, uh, the referring provider master list. Um, as far as discrete data in the patient's chart, their problem list, family history, medications, lab results, and vitals um, can come over in the data conversion. Uh, chart notes would be coming over as attachments, uh, same as uh, any scanned documents in the patient's okay. chart. Okay. Uh, and then from a, from a customization, like, you know, your, say you're, you mentioned calendar. So, appointment types, 
duration, um, just the, the lay of the land from day to day. If you, if you hard code, you know, new patients versus procedures and so forth, that's going to be done and taught to you during the implementation. And John, if you just go into the list editor, just that little Star Trek thing, this is, this is just kind of a, a look into the admin area of the product, which is security driven. And there's different drop downs there, but if you go to scheduling, you'll see kind of where we would manage your calendar uh, types, your appointment type statuses, your calendar templates. And so you, you have full ability to customize this. Okay. But, but that would not come up.